Uh, hi, my name is John Burnberry. I am the author of uh, When I Killed My Father, an assisted suicide family thriller. And I am a board member of BAPA, Bay Area Independent Publishers Association. And I'm talking today with Carl Skogen. Shurgren. Shurgren. That's right. I should have asked this, him this before. And uh, he's the author of The Fair Share Model. And I'm going to ask him to introduce himself and his book. Take it away. Hi, John. Hello, everyone. So I'm Carl Shurgren. I'm uh, author of a book called The Fair Share Model. And it's about a performance-based capital structure for venture stage initial public offerings. I say it's reimagining capitalism at the DNA level uh, because capital structures are expressions of human behavior and, and ownership interests. The uh, former chairman of Silicon Valley Bank called it an important work. So tell me what a capital structure is. Capital structure is, is how a corporation um, breaks up ownership interest. Okay, so what's important about this book? What's different about this book? What makes this book uh, a new model? In, in a way, it's a new model, but it's also just an adaptation of what works in the private capital market for the public market. Um, I think writ large, what I would say, uh, if you think about what the epic challenge of the 21st century will be from a, an env uh, economic standpoint, I would say that uh, its question is, can the benefits of capitalism be more broadly and fairly realized? So at its heart, that's what, what the book's about. Um, so you're sort of trying to save capitalism from itself by having it perform in a way that shares the benefits to more people. That's a good way to put it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because but it's not socialism. No, no. Uh, although the names suggest to some people um, that it is. The fair share aspect of it uh, kind of deals with how, in one part, it's trying to take the deal structure that's used by venture capital and private equity firms in a private market and apply it to the public market where average investors can uh, invest. It also speaks to trying to figure out how to uh, apportion the ownership interest between investors and employees when the company is at an early stage uh, raising capital. So it, that's what uh, I just read a few of the excerpts that you included. One of the features sounds like that, that the companies are owned by a broader cross section of the public and their workforce than is currently the case. Uh, maybe, I mean, this is a complex topic okay. uh, and, and you could pick up on that angle, but I would say it gets into sort of what's the value of an idea. I'm, I'm focused on what I call venture stage companies that are raising venture capital in a public offering. I say a venture stage company is um, basically a startup. Um, uh, it, but startups could be even companies like Uber um, that have been around for a while. The hallmark is that they are wholly dependent on infusions of equity capital to exist because they don't generate enough cash from their own operations. These types of companies are very hard to value. And, and typically when a company is raising equity, um, selling stock, selling a portion of itself, um, yet investors and the company have to agree on what the company is worth. Well, wh what about also the risk factor? I mean, uh, venture capitalists have a lot of money and they assume that they're going to fail a lot of the time, but your average investor may not be able to have that approach, right? Well, they won't have the amount of money. By the way, uh, a little secret on, on venture capital firms. Okay. The, uh, there's two types of partners. 
the, those who provide the capital, the limited partners and the general partners who actually operate the company. Those are the people being interviewed in articles and on TV. The general partners put 1% of all the capital in. 99% comes from the limited partners, which are typically universities, pension funds, uh, wealthy institutions. Um, they provide most of the capital. So in other words, the people that control things are leveraging their small percentage. Well put. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, uh, you, were, you were saying before that there are some analogies that are helpful in understanding this. Maybe you could share some of those? Yeah, so this capital structures are um, complex, but they're not really that difficult. What they are is unfamiliar to a lot of people, at least the people I'm writing for. Like me. So there's uh, a chapter I have in there, an orientation to uh, encourage people that even though this sounds like a foreign uh, uh, subject matter, you, you can understand it. Uh, and I make sure you, you understand it in basic terms. So I'll, I'll tell you two of the analogies. One is, I say, think of capital structures as art. And I describe how I experience art in a museum. Now I'll stand back and, and look, look at the art. Sometimes I'll get really close, look to the side, uh, look at the placard. Over time, I begin to notice things. And when I see a new piece, I, I can start to grasp something about it because I've, I've been taking in this information as I've been going along. So capital structures are like that because they're just really expressions of human behavior, which is art. The other uh, can analogy- I, can I push back? Go ahead. Can I push back on that for just a second. Uh, art is extremely subjective, right? Yeah. And what de who decides what art is is sort of hard to fathom sometimes, you know, what gets to go in a museum and what doesn't. Aren't capital structures more like data driven? No. No? Really? No. Okay, okay, go, go. Well, I mean, there, there, there is subject to personalities and, and times and places uh, as, as anything. You know, it used to be uh, when, when I began writing the book, I, I had a certain notion about how important voting rights uh, mm -hmm. would be to investors. And then I progressively saw where there were a number of tech companies that were experimenting with what they called dual class stock, where the goal was to give certain pre-IPO shareholders, usually founders, super voting shares. And um, kind of wondered, well, do investors care about that? And, and it seemed as if they really didn't. The, uh, the low point for that type of structure was a company a couple of years ago called Snap. There's a mobile app for making people faces look funny. They raised an enormous amount of money uh, with shares they couldn't vote at all. So there's, there's variation in there. Um, and I, I, I guess one of the points I make in the book is that public investors get a lousy deal the way it is right now, far inferior to what private investors would require for a company with that level of risk. So how do we get from, I'm assuming we don't have the fair share model operating now. No, it's just an idea. But let me tell you the other analogy before we go further. So it has to do with sex and sexuality. I okay. say it works for beer and automobiles. Why not capital structure? Okay. So the idea is think about societal attitudes back in the 1950s surrounding sex and sexuality. Okay. Think about where we are now. You say things have changed. A little, yeah. But physiology hasn't changed. No, no. It's the way we think about it. Right. So I say that where we are now in terms of how we think about ownership structures, capital structures, 
is the equivalent to where society was in the 1950s thinking about sex and sexuality. So it's going to change. It's going to change because uh, of, of notions getting out there where, where the hoi polloi are, are becoming aware that they get a lousy deal the way it is. So if I can extend the analogy, is it because capital structures are becoming more permissive and liberalized? Maybe that's a bad analogy. I, I would say it's because people are being, uh, the web is making information more available. So, um, and the, there's more interest rising interest in, in reimagining capitalism so that it works for more people. Is there a concrete, uh, concrete example with a, a company and product that, that how this might play out down the road in a way that, you know, that shows how it would sort of spread the benefits to more people? Not yet. This is okay. just an idea at this point. I'm imagining sort of a three-part process. The job of the book, I'm like Johnny Appleseed, basically sharing information and insight with people so they are acting like uh, the character in the movie network and they get the sense that they're really getting a bad deal the way things are. And I want them to open up their window, stick their heads out and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. Um, in a way, what I want people to do is at least allow for the possibility that there's innovation in capital structures and ownership that are possible that is good for the economy. So it's good for, for increasing dynamism in the economy. Uh, and you know, these types of companies that I'm talking about, venture stage companies, for decades, they've been the greatest source of uh, economic growth and job creation in the U.S. economy. It hasn't been Fortune 500 companies. It's been young companies that start up. So it's been a source of great wealth uh, for, for investors and, and just made our lives more interesting. Okay, so let me back up and, and, and ask you what led you to write a book like this, come up with this idea in the first place. Well, the backstory goes back to about 1997. Uh, I was at a company, an environmental technology company that was trying to raise venture capital. Uh, it was having difficulty getting attention from venture capital firms because nobody was really making money in environmental technology. The internet was just starting. Um, so we were really reliant on friends and family, angel investor type of, of, of funding. And it's very inefficient because it's, it's a lot of work because you have to work for every check and as lumpy as to when it comes in. And I was talking to another fellow who was a consultant there about just the inefficiency of it all. And we collaborated and came up with an idea that we, we decided to form a company around called Fairshare. And the idea was to form a membership of, of people who might want to invest in early stage companies on the internet, give them education about deal structures and valuation, give them the ability to interact with each other, sort of like a Facebook before there was a Facebook. And once we got to critical mass, we would tell companies, if you have a legal offering, if you pass due diligence, if you use our deal structure, and you allow our members to buy as little as $100, um, we give you free access to pitch your deal. Charge no commission, wouldn't handle anybody's stock or, or money. So fair share was a little bit too early. We had some success, but I underestimated the amount of time and uh, money that would have to go into dealing with regulatory anxiety. 
you know, the idea was, you know, here we were talking about small companies, the internet, and average investors in the same sentence, and it seemed like regulators were saying something's wrong here. Um, by the time we were on our path to, to resolve some of these things, um, the dot-com bubble burst, then the telecom bubble burst, and no one was really interested in these types of things. And at that point, I had spent three or four years on it. Um, I was sort of tired. I guess the only upside was I learned how to write about the complex topic of valuations and capital structures for people who didn't know what they were about. But I basically went into a fetal position for a decade or so. Then we had the Great Recession, and there was a uh, act passed by the Congress um, called the Jobs Act, jumpstart our startup business uh, type type uh, act, which basically made some adjustments in the securities regulations to make it easier for small companies to raise capital. And I thought that would have been a good time to start fair share. But, you know, I, I had other things going on and I, I thought surely, and crowdfunding was coming up. Um, crowdfunding would have been a good term for what we were trying to do back in, in, the, in the 90s. So I thought as all of this stuff was evolving, surely there would be people out there that came up with the same idea. But all the innovation that I saw was in new ways to sell stock. Nobody was talking about a new way to structure it. So I thought, all right, you can't get in trouble for writing a book. And I'm really put, no one else is going to be writing about structure, it seems. Right. So I decided to write the book. Can you tell me what the fair share model is as simply as possible? It, it um, the, the simplest explanation is it takes the, the venture capital model for private investing and applies it to the IPO market. Let me get, tell you what the mechanics are. There's two classes of stock, both vote, one trades, one doesn't. I, investors get the, uh, the tradable stock. That's the IPO investors and the pre-IPO investors. Employees get it as well for value generated as of the IPO date. For future performance, the employees get a voting stock that cannot trade. It converts into the tradable stock based on milestones that they describe in their offering document or prospectus, or subsequently both classes of stock agree to. So evaluation sort of unfolds based on performance as opposed to being set at the time the money's raised. So what's the most challenging thing about writing about this complicated subject? You finished the book. You, uh, I met you when you were working on it, and now you're finished it. Um, uh, what was the most challenging part of that process? How to break down this subject and uh, organize it for two different audiences. I assumed that my largest audience, say 70% of, of the readers, would be unfamiliar with capital structures. And about 30% would be experts. They have very different needs in terms of how they want to get information. Uh, novices need a gentle ramp, and experts want to get to it right away. So trying to figure out how to write for both of them, that was, that, that was the single most difficult thing. Did you, uh, like, say, if you already know this, go to chapter seven, or, or how did you do that? I must have reorganized the first few chapters four or five times. Um, and so what I came up with is hit it briefly 
right at the beginning. But also, and I had a couple sort of organizational uh, rules. I, I broke down the, the chapters into uh, little subsections. I'll show you an example. Like here's, you can see. Okay, you've got the bullet, like the bullet points at the beginning of each chapter. Yeah. So there, and 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 there's lots of bullet points there. Yeah. So, so I you wanted to get somebody right at the beginning of a bird's eye view, and then each section, where where I could, I would I would use illustrations. Okay. But then I also tried to break it down into short short subject areas. And, and so it becomes conversational where it's almost like, you know, a little breadcrumb leading to another breadcrumb, but not so much directing where I want the reader to go as much as giving them the sense that this is sort of, familiar. it's not too different from other things that they know in their own life. And, and so one of the things that was helpful in this whole process uh, for me was a, a book called Brain Mind Mapping by mm -hmm. Tony Buzon. I've heard of it, yeah. And it was, uh, kind of makes the point that we're, how, how life em emerges. Uh, he, he, he looked at, he used a, a tree, for example, with the trunk and the, the branches going off. Uh, could be cauliflower, you know, with the branches. Um, the whole idea that our mind looks for a pattern, mm -hmm. and and rather than nailing down all the details uh, for people, um, one one way to to help people learn is to just make a number of different points. And so I used that that idea, uh, I had an illustration in the book where I say, this is, I can't, don't know if you could tell, but that's an image of Athena um, and, and it's in a pointillist style. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea was that that's, I'm not trying to draw a picture as much as go to where your mind's going. And then there's another little image I put in the book Looks like a map. It talks about the different sections that you can see. There's about five sections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and as I talk, describe the five sections, I'm really using a, a metaphor of, of a river. Well, it does look like, it does look like a map. Yes. With yeah, a so it's, it, but it's, it's a meandering river. river where, you know, you can, it will take you in diff different places. And once you, you know sort of the basics of, as to what it's about, you can jump to wherever you want. So I, oh. I found that was sort of a liberating way is to, to don't try to beat one, one aspect of it too much. Try, try to do more of a, a, a buffet and, and sh show some connecting points, but rely on the reader really to see some on their own. Okay, so where can people find out more about you and or buy your book? Amazon is a, a provider of the print book and ebook. Uh, the ebook's also available on most ebook platforms. Uh, it's available through bookstores as well, but it would have to go through a special order. Mm -hmm. And your website? Fairsharemodel.com. Okay, I can remember um, that. People can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll send a, an email with uh, some articles I've written. Okay. Uh, to break down some of the different points. And uh, just so we have a little bit more roundabout picture of you, what do you do when you're not writing and thinking about these complicated subjects? Um, I like to play squash, but I haven't done that for a few months since we're in the pandemic. Yeah, I haven't done that uh, like, for about 35 years, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, swim, mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't done that either. So I'll get out, uh, 
at Friends Ed Gardens and um, uh, just do different things. I, I'm even reading your book. Oh, that sounds even better. Um, and are you writing another uh, more more on this same subject, or what's what's next in terms of your your um, publishing path? So this is a this, this is a movement book, and I'm trying to figure out how to make it work. Right. Um, You're trying to build a movement more than just write a book. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and there's there's a quote that I have in the book from uh, Vladimir Lenin. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, goes, yeah, I knew it. Uh, Socialist. <laughs> well, yeah, you had to get one in there, but it was a great quote because you know the idea that even for the American Revolution, um, you know, the ideas of uh, checks and balances, alternatives to feudal rule, mm -hmm. were being discussed by philosophers uh, several decades before the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. The United States was just the first attempt to to, to have a non-feudal rule, mm -hmm. and interestingly, the first uh, form of it, the Articles of Confederation, didn't work very well, and and then you know took about 15 years or so before the U.S. Constitution was created, and of course you had amendments that were required right out out of the block to get it passed. And then you've seen, you know, over the life of the country, so many attempts to amend the Constitution. So it's, it's, it's uh, movements take sustained effort. And, but the quote keep, from Lenin. And they keep iterating, is, yeah. Is uh, decades can go by and nothing happens. Weeks can go by and decades happen. So yeah. change is not a, a, a linear type of thing. My goal with the book is to get that critical mass, get people entertaining the idea, the notion in their own mind that it's possible to reimagine capitalism so it works better for more people, so that it encourages um, funding for the types of companies that are responsible for most economic growth and job creation. You, the idea is to get the capital markets more competitive, where they compete, companies compete for public capital by offering a better deal. And as the upside for them is if it's a well performing team, the employees wind up with more of the wealth that they create with their labor than a venture capitalist would allow them to have. That sounds good. Where do I sign up? <laughs> At the fairsharemodel.com, right? <laughs>